What's going on everyone? Scott here. Welcome back to the channel and welcome to Hate Week. We are almost at game day. Michigan State versus that school down the road on Saturday, 7.30 on BTN for the first time. I think it was since 2012, 2011. Had to be 2012, right? But i uh, not going to fact check that one. But first time in a long time, too, that both of these teams come into the game unranked. So it very well might not be the most pretty game of football that you will be watching on Saturday night. But it's the Paul Bunyan rivalry game, Michigan State, that school down the road. It's the best week of the football year, in my opinion. So we're here to preview the game, give a quick rundown of what we believe they will do uh, during the game, some of their key standout players, and then we'll move into what Michigan State will need to do to compete and win this game. Before we do that, if you could just hit that like and subscribe button down there for more Michigan State content. Obviously, we are in the heart of college football season, but college basketball is just about 10 days away or so, uh, tipping off not this Monday, next Monday. So a bunch of college basketball, Michigan State basketball content will be on the channel as well. NBA season just started this week as well. So make sure you subscribe so you don't miss a video. But let's just jump into what that school down the road, Michigan does. Uh, they've been rotating their quarterbacks pretty much all season. Uh, they were hyping up Alex Orgy as uh, like every off season, like the Michigan Detroit Free Press usually does. Um, that Alex Orgy was the next Heisman, and he was the next whatever great Heisman. I, I don't know. I don't know what they were talking about it, going into this year. You hadn't seen the kid throw a single pass, and it's show on the field, but they've rotated through Davis Warren, Jack Tuttle, and Alex Orgy, and they've all mightily struggled throwing the ball. Uh, 5.4 yards per completion average, a 6 to 9 touchdown to interception ratio. Um, not good. Orgy did provide a running threat out of the backfield, but the offense was still one-dimensional. They weren't completing passes downfield at a high enough rate or creating any explosives in that type of game. So, They've been one-dimensional all year. Obviously, they've had a good running game, and we'll get to that here in a second. But even with Orgy back there with that threat, still one-dimensional. You can still play a single high safety and, you know, just put everyone up there to stop the run. So the last couple games they have gone with Jack Tuttle. Uh, Sharon Moore was non-committal to who was starting on Saturday, if I had to guess, based on what I've heard other, you know, Michigan people saying is, sounds like they'll stick with Tuttle. But, you know, if things start going bad that, you know, they could, you know, flip to someone else during the game, I, I, I don't know. I also watched that 2017 game when John O'Korn threw, what was it, five interceptions to us in the pouring rain. Uh, great coaching and play calling over there by uh, Mr. Harbaugh. But uh, anyway, they didn't move on there. So obviously, like, two kind of different situations, obviously. But different points in, you know, both programs, you know, trajectory at, at that 2017 time and, you know, this game. But, you know, I just, I don't I don't see them switching during the game. I, I think they'll, they'll probably roll with Tuttle as they've been and, you know, see if it works. Um, but the ineffective passing game can directly lead to the poor wide receiver play and pass catching play that we've seen this season from them. Um, only tight end Colson Loveland, who is a really good, really good player, will play in the NFL. Uh, and wide receiver Samaj Morgan have over 100 yards on the season. Not in a game, on the season. Uh, Loveland with 344 yards and two touchdowns, and Samaj Morgan 106 and one touchdown. The running game, as we kind of already did mention, is where they make mostly all of their leeway on offense and where they've won their four games this season. Khalil Mullins has run the ball really well for them. 676 yards, seven touchdowns on 6.1 yards per carry average. Uh, the NCAA football cover athlete, 391 yards and three touchdowns. Uh, not exactly the stat line you want for your NCAA football cover athlete, but a little more on that later. Uh, the defense, while it hasn't necessarily been that dominant defense that they've had over the past three years from their um, run, it's still been very good and very effective. And it starts up front. Mason Graham, three and a half sacks, really stout up the middle. Kenneth Grant, two sacks and a fumble recovery. Then off the edge, Joseph Stewart. Five and a half sacks and a forced fumble, and then TJ Guy, two sacks. Uh, the linebacker room, you got to watch out for Ernest Hossman, 45 total tackles on the season, uh, leading the team there, uh, one sack, one interception. And Jay Sean Barham, 37 total tackles on the year there. But the DB room is, you know, really where they have 
arguably their best defensive player. I don't know. You can go back and forth between uh, Mason Graham and Will Johnson, which in my opinion, Will Johnson should have been the cover athlete from this team, not the guy who should have spent his summer doing a museum tour and doing some research instead of those photo shoots. Okay, never, we won't get into it, but um, uh, two interceptions on the year for uh, Will Johnson uh, on three, only three passes defended. So, I mean, lockdown corner, you know, probably top 10, 15 pick in next year's draft lock. And um, one of those picks was for an 86 yard touchdown return. He has two touchdowns on those uh, two picks as well. So, I mean, so really just don't throw the ball his way is, you know, most team strategy. Um, I believe that 86 yard return was against USC. Uh, but then behind him, you got Zeke, Benny, and Jair Hill uh, with an interception as well. Hill's a sophomore. He's been attacked the most of all the defensive backs this year with six passes defended on the year. Um, overall for Michigan, 21.1 uh, points per game average, 128.3 passing yards a game, and 180 rushing yards a game. The O-Lines allowed 13 sacks on the year. Uh, their third down efficiency, 38.46%. And they're 8 for 9 on field goals, so solid there. But the punting is where it gets interesting and, you know, where we'll start to kind of shift the conversation to the Michigan State side. 37-yard um, average for Michigan. For Michigan State with Ryan Eckley, one of the best punter in the Big Ten and one of the best punters in the country, 44.2 average. So, you know, this game, it's going to be a probably slow, grinded out game. This isn't going to be a high scoring 42 to 40 type of game. This is going to be a, uh, you know, I, you know, what's the stat that they open pretty much every broadcast of this game with, you know, the team that runs the ball the best or most effectively and has the most yards is the team that usually wins. You know, it's been like one or two odd off years, but you know, that's the case. So field position could play a huge factor in this game. Uh, but both teams like to possess the ball. They're both sitting at about 31 minute time of possession average. Um, overall efficiency on the year ranks Michigan 46, Michigan State right there at 48 as well. So pretty even in overall efficiency. Offensive efficiency, as you expect, Michigan State 66, Michigan 86, and I think kind of trending in different directions there. Defensive efficiency, uh, Michigan 32, and Michigan State 48. And this is the one that surprised me, and I will have to dig deeper into what their metrics look at because uh, special teams efficiency, Michigan 12, Michigan State 25. But um, given we didn't rattle off Jonathan Kim, the, Kim's numbers, but he's, I believe, missed one field goal on the season that was at a 55-yarder last week against Iowa. Hit some big time kicks, and obviously we just talked about the punting averages. So um, I'm not sure what they really go into there. And Michigan State hasn't, you know, given up any, you know, super explosives or touchdowns on special teams this year either. So, so I don't know what they go off there. I'll have to do some more research into that. But I thought that that was, you know, kind of weird and seemed kind of opposite. Um, for MSU to win this game, though, they need more of the same formula from the Iowa game: a balanced run and pass attack. The Iowa game, obviously, you saw a similar tough defense. Michigan State had eight and a half yards per completion and 5.3 yards per rush it was their most complete game as we talked about in the recap this season their last time out against Iowa the offensive line will need to have a similar game up front uh, last game there was no rotation we've seen kind of the first half of the season they were trying to rotate and find the right guys uh, that fit in the lineup there on the offensive line. Well, last game, they kept all five in the game throughout the whole time. Stanton Rammel, Ashton Lepo, Brandon Baldwin, Luke Newman, and Tanner Miller played all 74 offensive snaps. Michigan State also possessed the ball at 39 minutes, which is about eight minutes above their season average in time of possession. But they'll need to improve on third down efficiency, though. 5 for 13 last game. They're sitting at 40.78% on the season, so right about there. But you convert on those third downs to keep the Michigan defense on the field. Try to wear them out. You'd be efficient on offense and on defense. You got a shot to win this game. You know, the line opened up at about 6.5. It quickly went down to about 4.5, then 3.5. I think right now it was at like 4. Last time I checked, I believe, um, I could be wrong, it, it's been changing over the last couple days. And then back in June, when it opened up, I mean, it opened at, like, what, 26 and a half? And really, I, I, 
everyone should have hopped on that then. And again, I'm not saying that I'm not, I'm not going into this game saying that, you know, Michigan State is going to win this game, you know, because Michigan State has been volatile this year and it has been, you know, kind of a roller coaster like it does and should with a young team. But in the offseason, seeing that 26 and a half, whoever saw that and whoever hopped on that should have because they're, I don't, I mean, I don't think anyone thought that Michigan's offense would be playing the way they are. But, you know, you had to look at the guys they lost, the coaches they lost, that they didn't really address the quarterback in terms of going to get a star, which, I mean, you know, to be fair, it was later in the cycle that they would have been looking. I'm not sure when, like, Cam Ward went to Miami and, you know, some of the other transfer quarterbacks that were out there, but there had to have been something out there that was better than what they have on the roster right now and can actually throw a forward pass and can actually complete a pass 10 yards or more downfield. But um, I'm not complaining that they're not. But listen, I could see Michigan State winning this game just as easily as I could see them losing this game, just with the roller coaster that has been this season. If both teams play how they played last week, then I think Michigan State, you know, will win, you know, by a touchdown or so. It's not going to be a blowout either way. But I am curious to see how they come out and respond. They they came out and swung pretty well in the Ohio State and Oregon game. Obviously, those were two big-time night games. Obviously, one of those being on the road. Obviously, this is going to be your biggest game of the season. Your biggest rivalry game, Aiden Childs, Jonathan Smith. All these guys, their first time in this rivalry, getting a taste of it. So I'm curious how they come out. I think that first drive is going to be big to get those passes rolling, to, you know, maybe break a couple runs, get a couple first downs, keep the chains moving, and at least come away with the field goal on that first drive. I think it's going to be very important to keep things moving on the offensive side of the ball. You cannot start the game with a three and out. But the defense is going to have to stand up as well, as we said. They have a tough running game with Cleo Mullins running the ball back there. So it's definitely going to be a challenge. And, you know, this is, you know, really one of the years, there's only been a, a few years and, you know, hardly any of, you know, these games or especially these rivalry games um, that I really have no idea what is going to happen. And I can tell you completely, like, I have no idea what is going to happen Saturday night in that stadium. I, I really have no idea. And this is the first time and I can't tell you how long where I've genuinely had zero idea what was going to happen. Um, you know, I think there was positive, positive signs, you know, last week from Michigan State that you would hope, you know, will carry over to this game, but you just don't know. You don't, you don't know what these things, um, you hope it does, but, um, it'll be a good time. It'll be a good time. We'll definitely probably not sleep tonight and we'll be trying to keep my mind off things all day tomorrow on Saturday leading up to the game. But overall, looking forward to it as always. I wanted to drop a rivalry note here too real quick for Jonathan Smith at Oregon State. He was 2-4 and four against Oregon. I don't think he, I don't remember the exact order of the wins, but I don't think he got a win against Oregon until about three years in. I think he won years three and five. Uh, so there's that. Obviously, Oregon State was a different deal than he's taking over obviously here at Michigan State, a lot more talent on Michigan State's roster. So not comparing the two, but just, you know, kind of an idea of where uh, Coach Smith was at at Oregon State, even though it really has nothing to do with this. Just wanted to throw it in there. Um, now into our week, what are we into? Week nine, college football bets. Last week, we went four and three. So we were positive. We're moving in the right direction, 17 and 19 on the season. Going to start out, as we always do, with our game. Michigan State, I have alternate line minus 3.5 at Michigan. Got that at plus 100. Then I got Washington plus 6.5 at Indiana at minus 102. Navy plus 12.5 versus Notre Dame, minus 102. Then I got Missouri plus 16.5 at Alabama, minus 104. And lastly, Texas A&M minus 3.5 at home versus LSU. Got that at plus 122. $5 there wins you $165.79. So let's just buckle it. No idea what is going to happen in the stadium on Saturday night. I, I don't think anyone really does. So, But I'm really excited to see how the guys come out and how the coaching staff uh, prepares them. We saw what they were able to do coming off a of bye week, making the necessary changes, and having an incredible performance and most complete performance of the season last week. So 
Hopefully we can see more of the same this week. Obviously not coming off a of bye week. But you know, I have to imagine they worked on Michigan some during the bye week, knowing that these were the next two games coming up. And you know, Iowa and Michigan, kind of similar concepts type of teams. So I'm excited. Uh, but make sure you are subscribed to the channel. We'll obviously be back after the game with the recap and more stuff on the channel as well. So make sure you're subscribed down there. But that'll do it for this one. Thank you all so much for watching. We'll see you in the next one. Peace out.